All right, welcome everybody. So this is the Prejudice and Discrimination Lecture uh, for Fall 2020. Uh, so the outline of what I'm going to talk about, uh, have some opening things I'd like to say about the naturalistic fallacy and systemic causes of uh, discrimination. Uh, then we're going to get into the more psychological topics, the authoritarians, right-wing authoritarians, uh, a really good example of implicit prejudice. And then I'm going to talk about a couple of different methods for ending prejudice and discrimination. So first off, I always uh, feel it's necessary to bring up the naturalistic fallacy. And as the name implies, it is a fallacy, so that means that it is wrong. Uh, and the naturalistic fallacy is assuming that if something is natural, therefore it is morally acceptable. That is, what is natural is moral. Or another way of putting it is if something exists, if it's natural, it's good. So if it exists, it's good. Uh, and that is you know, false. Not everything that exists is good. Poisons exist, but they will kill us. And uh, as a social psychologist, you know, sometimes I run into the problem where if I study a phenomenon, people believe that I approve of it. And this is just the good old naturalistic fallacy. That is, if I study racism, or if I research racism, or if I talk about racism, uh, therefore I approve it. And this is just ex another example of the naturalistic fallacy. Another way of putting it is you could go up to a researcher who studies cancer and you say, well, you know, cancer kills people. It's horrible. And they'll say, yeah. So why do you study it? Why do you like cancer so much? And of course, a doctor is trying to understand cancer so they can end it or cure it. And the same metaphor could be applied to social psychologists and the topics that we're going to talk about today. So let's uh, get into some definitions. And so first off, a stereotype. A stereotype is a belief about the characteristics, attributes, and behaviors of a, uh, a group and its members. And that's the same thing as a schema. Uh, so everything I've told you about a schema apply. Oh, look at how parallel those lines are. I can't believe I drew them. Everything I've told you about a, a schema applies to the stereotype. It's just an older version of the, uh, of the idea that we now call today a schema. And an example of a stereotype is that Asians are good at math. Prejudice is an attitude towards a particular group and its members. And it's an attitude, so uh, you know, it's a belief or it's some type of cognition. And so, for example, we say that Sarah dislikes Muslims. Uh, that's an example of a prejudiced attitude. That is, her attitude, her evaluation of another group is negative. Discrimination uh, is the unequal treatment of indiv ugh, individuals based on their group membership. Uh, and discrimination is a behavior. We've talked about attitudes and, and schemas. Discrimination describes a behavior, and based on the target of this behavior, we give discrimination diff different specific names. Uh, racism, uh, when the targets are members of uh, different racial groups. Sexism, when the, target is, uh, the targets are members of one gender. Uh, heterosexual, uh, heterosexism or homophobia. Uh, when the target uh, are uh, gay people, ageism, when uh, the target is people of different ages, and the more awkward term, anti-immigrant bias, when we're prejudiced against immigrants. And in America today, we need to identify racism out of that list as, you know, something that deserves special treatment, uh, the term itself. Uh, racism is a type of discrimination. So it is, again, the unequal treatment of individuals based on their ethnic group. But 
today when we talk about racism, we recognize the systemic foundation of racism. That is, racism, racism is not based on one individual treating another individual differently, but it's the process in which the entire uh, culture treats uh, African Americans differently. And of course now we're just talking about specifically American racism. And uh, that uh, the educational system, the economic system, the justice system, the media, these systems are biased against black people and in favor of white people. And so if you would stop individuals from discriminating against black people tomorrow, you would still have these powerful supports of treating black people differently in America. Uh, that's a strong statement, so uh, I guess I should back that up with some data. Uh, this is from an organization called United for a Fair Economy, and it's looking at median uh, income levels, average income by race, uh, over a span of almost 50 years. And we can see that while uh, salaries increase for both black uh, and uh, white people, or white families, we see that the average income for a white family has always been above or been greater than a black family. And also we can see that between 1947 and comparing that to the last year that we have, uh, 2005, we see that the difference or the gap between white families and black families has widened. Uh, again, uh, people will say, well, could that be because black people don't want to work that hard or that they're not good with money? And that's one way of justifying the systemic causes of racism. But as you look into the culture and the data more, you clearly see that what's going on is that the economic system is set up to treat blacks and whites differently. Uh, more about the economic system. Uh, this is a very interesting statistic. Households with zero or negative worth. Uh, that is, how much money do you have in the bank? Uh, do you have some saved up or do you have nothing? Or do you have nothing or actually you owe more than you have? And 13% of the white families in 2004 uh, had zero or negative worth, but a third, 30%, of black households uh, had zero or negative worth. So again, we see the results of the systemic racism, the systemic economic racism, in that black families are at a more greater disadvantage than white families, or a larger number than, of black families than white families. Uh, home ownership is a very important idea in the United States, and uh, uh, you know, many people feel that it's very critical uh, to a healthy economy and a healthy society. And we can see that uh, the gap between white ownership and black ownership of their home, homes have grown since 1970 to 2007. We can also talk about differences in the uh, justice system. Uh, Again, we see when we look at the data for black and white males and females, we see wildly different rates of incarceration. Uh, back in 1974, uh, we saw that on average white males uh, had 1.4% ch chance of ever being incarcerated, black males 10.4%. Uh, you know, and that gap has only increased between 1974 and uh, 2001. Uh, what we see here uh, is a graph of the uh, you know, hourly pay gap relative to white men. And so the lowest uh, you know, uh, number here on the y-axis is 15%. 
uh, what we'd want to have is everything at one per, at zero percent because when all of the different groups black men wh uh, white women and black women when they're all uh, at zero percent that means that there is no difference between what we pay black people and women uh, you know from the standard of white men uh, but we see that while there has been some successes among women both black and white uh, during the 80s and we see that their uh, the their pay gap gap is closing uh, we see that since the 90s their pay gap has kind of slightly increased and uh, white women have continued to have this downward trend and black men have seemed to hit, hit a plateau here uh, so again uh, we have really mixed treatment of people and again this is uh, your uh, pay and so it's really not based on in you know personal motivation or skill or intelligence it's based on how much you're being paid because of your race or your gender and then uh, I think one final graph uh, reports of anti-Muslim assaults since 2001 Hey, fever day, sorry. And we can see an increase in 2001, but then after that, it in, you know, continued to be high. And in 2015, the last year that it was uh, measured, it was almost as high as it was uh, after the, uh, the year after the 9-11, uh, you know, World Trade Center attacks. And again, uh, this is a systemic problem in that Muslim Americans are feel more threatened and that will definitely change their behavior and so uh, again we see these systemic uh, ways in which we are trying to control certain groups of people and one final thing in terms of introducing the topic uh, there's been three waves of thinking about prejudice by social psychologists. The first wave uh, during the 20s and the 50s recognized it as an individual pathology. That is, uh, you know, prejudice was abnormal. Uh, during the 60s and the 80s, uh, uh, we mainly focused on it in terms of, uh, you know, the results of categorization, categorization and intergroup conflict. And only since the 90s have we really started to look at the idea of implicit processes and measuring implicit processes and uh, examining the automatic activation of these negative associations. Uh, and notice that this was from 2001. Maybe we could say that a fourth wave uh, which is beginning maybe around uh, 2019 is that social psychologists are finally catching on that it is a systemic problem my handwriting with the mouse is getting better and that we need to also look at the uh, ways in which uh, uh, you know uh, implicit prejudice and implicit, implicit pro processes support uh, the systems that we talk about. All right, so uh, one of the major topics that I like to talk about when we talk about racism is the authoritarians. And uh, we, what we're doing here is talking about different types and different uh, causes of racism. And I think that talking about the authoritarians and right-wing authoritarians is a very useful way of understanding it. Uh, and uh, especially focusing on certain elements of the authoritarian personality. So uh, when we talk about currently uh, right-wing authoritarian personality or authoritarians, 
uh, we talk about the research of Robert Altmaier or Bob Altmaier, uh, Canadian social psychologist. There's Bob, uh, retired recently from uh, University of Manitoba. Uh, and uh, he started out doing research on the authoritarian personality that was discussed in your textbook, but realized that that research was really not valid and started to conduct his own research on the authoritarian personality and developed his own theory about uh, you know, the authoritarian personality, which he calls the right-wing authoritarian personality. And he has this wonderful quote, uh, they, the authoritarians, dislike so many different kinds of people, I have called them equal opportunity bigots. Indeed, what's very interesting is that this personality type, uh, and it is a personality type, people who have this personality type really do dislike all outgroups. They are equal opportunity bigots. Uh, what distinguishes this personality type? And Altmaier identified three elements to the personality type. The first is a high degree of submission to the established legitimate authorities in society. Uh, and submission means to obey and to uh, really uh, not just obey, but uh, kowtow to authority. And uh, that is one characteristic of this personality. Disorder, uh, this personality. Uh, the second is high levels of aggression in the name of the authority. That is, uh, this personality uh, tends to want to aggress against outgroups. They'll do that very easily, and they will also uh, do it very easily in response to calls from their leaders. And then finally, the third is a high level of conventionalism. That is, right-wing authoritarians feel that they are normal or they are traditional, uh, and everyone else is you know, wrong or abnormal. So let's look at each one of these individually. So first off, authoritarian submission. Uh, that is the high degree of submission to uh, the authorities, uh, and especially in terms of, oh, excuse me, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. A high degree of submission to the authorities who are perceived to uh, be established and legitimate in the society in which one lives, in which one lives. Uh, examples of submission to dangerous authority, uh, Richard Nixon in America, Adolf Hitler in Germany, George Bush, uh, GW, and of course, Donald Trump. Not saying that just to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, controversial, but when you look at it, we see that uh, with President Bush, uh, he really rallied the American people around him after the 9-11 attacks and was able to get a great deal of submission and agreement from more or less the entire country. Uh, so uh, he would be, again, a, a good example or a good illustration of authoritarian submission. And the look on this woman's face, in fact, almost everybody's face here, is probably another example of authoritarian submission, this absolute love and devotion uh, to the authority figures. Back to the second uh, you know, characteristic, which is aggression. And this is a general aggressive aggressiveness against everybody, uh, but it's usually directed against various people uh, that are per perceived to be sanctioned by the established authorities, and we're getting back to authorities. Uh, so generally, any weaker outgroups, that is, any uh, subgroups in the society that are perceived to be weaker than other groups, usually are the targets of authoritarians, of right-wing authoritarians, uh, and especially any group identified by the authority figure. If the authority figure says this group, let's target this group, then you see uh, an unbelievable outpouring of aggression towards that outgroup. And again, we have uh, some very sad examples from American history. Uh, you know, we have the rendition of uh, Arabs uh, during the Gulf War and the Iraq War. 
uh, that is, if you don't know what, what rendition is, <clears throat> excuse me, it is a uh, legal term which means that you will kidnap somebody legally. And so you could be walking down the street uh, in America or in another country and a van would uh, pull up and some American uh, soldiers or CIA agents who are not dressed in uniform will hop out of this van grab you, put a black bag over your head, and toss you into the van. You'll later end up in an airplane, and you will fly to an undisclo undisclosed location, which will be your prison for an undisclosed amount of time. Uh, America did this. In fact, a York student, a uh, psychology major, her job was a stewardess on one of the airlines. <laughs> the CIA had their own airline to do this and she was a stewardess not that she like served the people they were rendering uh, but she was there to you know feed and basically take care of the comfort of the soldiers or the agents that had d done the rendering uh, other examples uh, today in uh, america we have the detention of uh, immigrants at ice facilities and the general abuse and, in some ways, torture of immigrants in these, uh, you know, uh, jails and makeshift jails. Uh, a perfect example that's very, uh, you, know, you know, newsworthy today. Uh, Trump, uh, President Trump, the authoritarian uh, leader, uh, tweeted, liberate Michigan uh, in response to Governor Whitmer's uh, mask, uh, you know, ordinances, and just recently the FBI thwarted a, uh, uh, you know, right-wing, uh, you know, terrorist group's attempt to kidnap the governor and uh, put her on trial and execute her. So, again, we see the idea of any group that the authoritarian leader says you should target, all that the authoritarian leader needs to do is say sick them and people will do it and again a very disturbing picture uh, you know uh, you know the to illustrate the general aggressiveness of authoritarians and finally conventionalism uh, the high degree of adherence to social conventions that are perceived uh, to be endorsed by society and its established authorities and so Right-wing authoritarians feel that they are traditional, they are normal, uh, and so it's not surprising that Fox News would be reporting on the war on Christmas uh, in that uh, Christmas is a very traditional way in America to uh, celebrate the end of the year, uh, and any attempt uh, at doing anything differently or more inclusively uh, is wrong and uh, constitutes a war or uh, here last summer uh, we saw uh, President Trump standing with a Bible in front of a church uh, that he's never went to ever uh, probably a book that he really is rarely read uh, but again uh, he is using symbols of conventional American society uh, churches and Bibles Christian churches and Christian Bibles and again, uh, this high degree that they want to be traditional, they want to be normal, and they want the entire country to be like them and be normal or be traditional. And I could go on for a long time, and I would actually encourage you to read some of Bob Altmyer's books on, uh, you know, the right-wing authoritarians. They're very easy to read. Uh, some are available free online. I could go on and talk about uh, other things about the authoritarians, uh, but I have to limit myself. But one thing I think is important is to talk about right-wing authoritarian thinking. Uh, and there are some very interesting twists to the way authoritarians think. For example, Altmaier found that authoritarians uh, are able to accept and see as you know, uh, logical, very illogical thinking. Uh, for example, if you give people this uh, syllogism 
All fish live in the sea, sharks live in the sea, therefore sharks are fish. That's logically incorrect. Uh, but uh, right-wing authoritarians, more than people who score low on right-wing authoritarian scales, are more likely to accept this as correct. Uh, double standards. Right-wing authoritarians are more likely to accept double standards. In one experiment, uh, you know, uh, Altmaier described to people who are either high or low on measures of right-wing authoritarianism, uh, an incident where either Canadians Against Perversion or, rights, or the organization Rights for Gays uh, held a rally and the speaker got everybody stirred up and they actually uh, rioted a little bit and destroyed a couple buildings. And what uh, uh, you know, Altmaier found was those who were high in right-wing authoritarian uh, thinking, they would be more likely uh, to let the Canadians Against Perversion people go, uh, you know, free, but more likely to want to see the rights for gays people uh, to go to jail uh, for the same offenses. So they have double standards. They're not judging actions, but they're judging people. And then uh, finally, they have highly compartmentalized minds. And that more than anything is what I see going on in America today, uh, where we have uh, the pandemic and people dying and uh, field hospitals now being put up in Wisconsin because that's where the pandemic is burning the uh, brightest now and people in Wisconsin are saying that we need to go out go without our masks and that uh, this is just a uh, you know uh, conspiracy against us to make us wear masks for some reason and masks don't work and they're perfectly willing to accept that logic while at the same time hundreds of thousands of Americans have died from the virus. And the, you know, the idea that you can create one compartment in your mind and another compartment in your mind and you can keep things that are related to each other separate from each other. Uh, that is you know, a, a typical behavior of most people but it's highly recognizable in people who are right-wing authoritarians. Another example of this compartmentalization, this compartmentalization, uh, is how evangelicals, that is, Christians, white Christians, uh, you know, uh, support Trump. Uh, back in 2016, during the primaries, uh, evangelicals supported Trump uh, much more over uh, Ted Cruz, even though T Cruz was a church-going evangelical. Trump just uh, courted the evangelicals. Uh, Trump is not an evangelical. Uh, he only attends, uh, attends, attends a church on Christmas and Easter, if he does ever. Uh, he was pro-abortion back then. He has owned strip clubs and casinos. He was on the Playboy cover, of the cover of Playboy magazine, uh, and he was divorced twice. All of these things uh, evangelicals would look down on. Uh, his current wife is a swimsuit model. Uh, yeah, here we go on the cover of Playboy, and uh, the first lady, I still can't believe this, uh, her photo shoot. Uh, all of these things are anathema to evangelicals, but they will uh, accept Trump because for some reason Trump is the more traditional, the more authoritarian leader. And of course, you can't get even ever more uh, compartmentalized than somebody who uh, goes on Howard Stern and talks about uh, grabbing women by their private parts, and then somebody who just shows up in front of a church for a photo op and not really realizing that what's going on here is that somebody is lying about some part of their life. And being compartmentalized means that you can accept both of these contradictory facts at the same time. So where do these authoritarians come from? 
And the key that uh, Altmaier found was fear. Uh, authoritarians are generally taught fear from their parents. And they're taught like a general, uh, you know, a fear of uh, this general threat. You know, like there's robbers or there's con men or there's kidnappers out there, so you got to be careful. But then they're also taught fear of specific outgroups. Uh, what you better stay away from the black parts of town, because if they see a white person, they'll you know beat you up or rob you. You better stay away from gay people. Uh, you know, if you have a gay roommate in college, you might wake up and well, you know. So you're being taught to fear these outgroups, but also to fear uh, every people in general, not just people, but most of the people with high right-wing authoritarian beliefs, they believe that the world will end soon. So they are highly fearful people. Uh, however, you can say not all children with high right-wing authoritarian parents grow up to be right-wing authoritarians. What goes on? And what goes on is that children have experiences which invalidate the lessons that their parents uh, taught them. Uh, and that's why uh, not all the time do you have right-wing authoritarian children growing up to be right-wing authoritarian adults. Uh, for example, uh, you can be told by your parents, oh, when you go to college, you know, stay away from gay students. You know, they may rape you or something like that. Uh, they're horrible people. And then in college, you have a gay friend and you realize that everything that your parents told you about gay people was wrong. So then you start thinking, maybe what my parents told me about black people is wrong or what they told me about Asians or the world in general. In fact, the one thing Altmaier discovered which really does the best at uh, stopping people from growing up to be right-wing authoritarians is going to college. Uh, in college you learn about different uh, types of people, different uh, groups of people, you get exposed to different people, especially in dormitory colleges, and uh, uh, that seems to have the greatest effect on reducing authoritarianism. And then finally, what does Altmaier say about reducing right-wing authoritarianism in general? Uh, first off, he says don't argue with them. Arguing with them is useless on the one hand, but also it will threaten them. And anything that threatens them will make them more fearful, and that will make them more authoritarian. And in fact, you should do things to reduce fear. Uh, you know, as I always like to joke, you know, there's a thing on the internet that uh, tells you which one of your relatives is a racist. It's called Facebook. And I've learned a lot of my relatives are racist through Facebook this year and the last four years. But one thing I've done before I've alienated all my relatives <laughs> is that I wouldn't argue with them when they post horribly racist things. But what I would do was I would try to uh, talk to them and show them that what they're really worried about is not true and it's not going to happen. Uh, I don't know how effective I was, uh, but that would be one method that Altmaier would uh, suggest. A very, very interesting manipulation was developed by Napier et al. 2017 not about right-wing authoritarian, but about prejudice in general, uh, working on the idea that fear uh, usually causes, uh, you know, prejudice and discrimination. Uh, what Napier and her colleagues did was they asked people just to imagine that they had superpowers, like they could fly like Superman. And that manipulation, just asking people to think about flying like Superman, caused them to feel less threat. And it caused them uh, to be more socially uh, you know, liberal, less racist, and uh, more uh, you know, accepting of social change. Uh, a, uh, you know, old uh, slogan building on the theme of what would Jesus drive? Uh, that is, 
one thing that really surprised Altmaier when he was looking at authoritarians is that he discovered that a lot of evangelical churches were actually doing things that were very ecologically supportive and green. And because some of the evangelical churches were thinking about, well, what would Jesus drive? That is, what would Jesus do if he was here today? What would he require of us? Uh, and, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, what they did is they started looking at that and they would divest their church, uh, you know, stock portfolios from companies that polluted. They would try to, you know, install solar power on their churches. And uh, what Altmaier suggested is that you could do the same thing uh, with other things. That is, how would Jesus respond to what's going on today with Black Lives Matter? And really, you know, causing evangelicals, and remember, right-wing authoritarians are going to be evangelicals, they're going to be traditional Christians, because that's what's traditional in American society. You go back to the 1950s, everybody was white, everybody was middle class, everybody was a Christian. Uh, so that's tradition. And so, uh, you know, you, know uh, you can use, uh, you know, the, their religious beliefs as a lever to get into uh, some of the more negative beliefs that they have. Higher education, as I mentioned before, is an extremely powerful way of reducing right-wing authoritarianism. It's very difficult for somebody to go through college without reducing. Uh, having laws that force people not to be racist, uh, and Altmaier said that this would probably work because it acts as an excuse for people who are going to be racist because it's traditional, but they don't really feel that well, you know, they don't feel really that good about it, probably because of their Christian beliefs. And so a law that says that you can't discriminate against black people can certainly be used as an excuse by a business owner to get out of doing something that they don't really want to do, but just seems like they should do because it's traditional. And finally, modeling uh, standing up to uh, racism. And remember Milgram's defiant teachers? Uh, that is, when you had three people uh, giving the shocks and two uh, of the teachers would quit, uh, the third real subject, uh, they only continued on in the experiment at a 10% level. So, uh, you know, uh, thinking about somehow modeling that type of defiance among right-wing authoritarians uh, to requests to aggress against someone. So uh, this is where we're going to end up for part number one of the lecture. I'll see you on part number two.